go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, virtual meeting of the Columbia Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. We're really delighted that you could join us tonight, uh, especially in, in honor of this important day of uh, the International Holocaust Memorial Day. And we're really delighted that tonight's uh, lecturer is our very own Dr. Kenneth Prager, uh, speaking on how physicians partnered with the Nazi regime, possible lessons for today. But I am going to hold off on introducing Dr. Prager and turn that over to my colleague, um, Dr. Catherine Fishkoff. But before I do that, I just want to invite you to follow us on social media or join our email listserv uh, by emailing ethics at cumc.columbia.edu. And we'll go ahead and drop that email address in the chat so that you can find us. Um, the topic for tonight's discussion is really one of our most popular lectures among medical students. And uh, partly because of that, partly because of the content, we've now made it an annual lecture every January, coinciding with the International Holocaust Memorial Day. Uh, our time together tonight will consist of a lecture from Dr. Prager for about 45 minutes, followed by a, a period of Q&A for about 30 minutes with a hard stop at 7.45. And I'm, I'm so grateful and delighted that Dr. Fishkoff will moderate that time with us. We also ask that if you have questions, and, and Dr. Fishkoff will remind you of this, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat feature, and then she'll draw from that uh, during the Q&A. So without further delay, I'll introduce Dr. Catherine Fishkoff, who is an Associate Professor of Surgery and Critical Care. Uh, I'm so grateful that she's one of my colleagues on the Clinical Ethics Consultation Service at uh, Columbia's Milstein Hospital, one of the New York Presbyterian Hospitals in New York City. Dr. Fishkoff is an acute care surgeon and intensivist. Uh, she is working with us at the Columbia University Irving Medical Center. She's a certified ethics consultant and an active member of our committee, of our ethics committee at the hospital, uh, really has such a critical role in helping to craft policy, uh, ethics related policy for the hospital, and just is a wonderful colleague. She also serves on the Society of Critical Care Medicine Ethics Committee as well as the American College of Surgeons Ethics Committee. And she is also the vice chair of the Department of Surgery, Quality and Patient Safety Committee. So wears many hats. Uh, and without any further ado, I will turn it over to you, Catherine. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lydia. And it is my great pleasure now to introduce Dr. Kenneth Prager. Uh, Dr. Prager is a professor of medicine, director of medical ethics and the chair of the Medical Ethics Committee at the Columbia University Medical Center. He is a member of the Ethics, Professionalism, and Human Rights Committee of the American College of Physicians. He spent two years in the Indian Health Service practicing general medicine on Cheyenne River Sioux Indian Reservation in South Dakota after his medical internship, not something that any of us have done at least. Dr. Prager held clandestine medical clinics in the Soviet Union during a visit to persecuted Jews in 1986 and later set up the first US Soviet medical student exchange program between Columbia um, PNS, the medical school, and the first Moscow Medical Academy. Dr. Prager is a pulmonologist and teaches pulmonology and medical ethics to medical students, house officers, and nurses. His writings on medicine and medical ethics have appeared in medical journals and textbooks, as well as on the op-ed pages of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Dr. Prager was a regular guest lecturer in Israel for the Ben-Gurion University MD program in international health and medicine in collaboration with Columbia University Health Sciences. He's received numerous awards for his patient care, clinical expertise, teaching, and contributions to organ donation. Among these are the Leonard Toe Humanism and Medicine Award and the Columbia University Presidential Award for Excellence in Teaching. And of course, on a more personal note, he has been a phenomenal mentor for me uh, and many, many, many others. So I know that we are all looking forward to hearing from Dr. Prager. And one final reminder to please any questions along the way, you don't have to wait till the end, you can start putting them into the chat or the Q&A box and I will keep an eye on it and we will get to them when Dr. Prager is finished. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fishkop, and thank you, Dr. Dugdale. Um, and so, as Dr. Dugdale mentioned, today is International Holocaust Memorial Day, so it is a special day and particularly appropriate that we speak about this tonight. Um, I'll start by saying that 
my interest in this area of how the Nazi doctors uh, became really participated in an integral fashion with the uh, Holocaust uh, began after I made a visit to Berlin under the auspices of an organization called Medicine After the Holocaust, which is a Houston-based organization. And its mission is to challenge doctors, nurses, bioscientists to personally confront the medical ethics of the Holocaust and apply that knowledge to contemporary practice and research. And um, this was approximately uh, four years ago. Um, it was entitled Physician Assisted Suicide and Euthanasia After the Holocaust. Um, the, uh, Dr. Rubenfeld is the founder of this organization, Center for, Medical, um, <clears throat> for uh, Medicine After the Holocaust in Baylor, and uh, 19 bioethicists from the U.S. attended a five-day program in Berlin in May of 2018, and we heard presentations by German scholars on subjects pertaining to the role of physicians in implementing Nazi programs of forced sterilization and euthanasia, primarily of German citizen. This preceded the Holocaust, and I hope to show you today how the uh, Nazi physician uh, <clears throat> involvement with their own fellow German citizen was a prelude to the, to the Holocaust in which six million Jews were killed. So uh, the outline is, I'm going to try to impress upon you the critical role that doctors played, German doctors played in the horrendous Nazi crimes against their own people and then people of other nations, and you must, you're obviously thinking, how could German medicine be perverted to this degree? Um, I'm going to speak about the critical role that was played by the so called science of eugenics in Nazi ideology, and unfortunately, its American role model. I, I will try to impress upon you that there is a slippery slope, as was demonstrated uh, historically in Germany. Forced sterilization there led to euthanasia led to the Holocaust and possible lessons for today. I uh, have added this slide this year because I think you should know that there are some, I have some personal reflections on the Holocaust. Had my grandparents not emigrated from Poland in the early 20th century, I would not be here tonight. I would surely have been killed having been born in January, 1943, right in the midst of the Holocaust. And in fact, my father's first cousin, his wife, and two young children were gassed in one of the health fact in one of the um, I'm sorry death factories in Treblinka. I have also treated hundreds of Holocaust survivors, and I've heard their stories. And in 2000, I visited Auschwitz with my wife, and I buried a list that I had of hundreds of Holocaust survivor patients, with the number of their immediate relatives who were murdered. I buried them in the snows that were adjacent to the gas chambers. And I wrote a piece about this, which was published in JAMA in June of 2001. So what is this Nazi medicine uh, involvement? Well, here are some of the stark numbers. 400,000 German patients sterilized, 5,000 German pediatric patients murdered, euthanized, 70,000 German adult patients euthanized, cruel and murderous medical experiments on approximately 30,000 concentration camp inmates, most of them Jews and others. Four million Jews who were selected and gassed and two million Jews shot or killed by other means. And I think this quotation by Joseph Stalin attributed to him, whether he said it or not, I don't know, but it bears contemplation. A single death is a tragedy. A million deaths is a statistic. When we read in the, um, uh, you, the death of George Floyd, a single death, a murder of a single individual, you see the outrage that it led to. Uh, obviously, it, it was uh, uh, symbolic for a great deal of other issues aside from the death of a, one human being. But one human being's death is something that we can digest. It's a tragedy. When you talk about 6 million, 10 million, it, it passes over us. It cannot be really digested, but those are in fact the numbers that occurred. To start off by saying that German doctors were absolutely indispensable in the design and implementation of eugenicide, the killing of weak or defective people to improve the gene pool. 
A greater percentage of German physicians were members of the Nazi party and the SS, which was the stormtroopers, the elite murderers of the Nazi party. More doctors than any other profession were uh, represented in these organizations in Germany. By 1945, almost half of all German physicians were members of the Nazi party and 7% of doctors were in this elite group called the SS versus only 0.5% of the population. What about German medicine before and during the Third Reich? At the turn of the 20th century, Germany was the world leader in medical research and practice. And this is a quote from an outstanding book by Proctor, The Nazi War on Cancer. Nazism took root in the world's most powerful scientific culture, boasting half of the world's Nobel Prizes at that time and a sizable fraction of the world, world's patents. German science and medicine were the envy of the world. And many leading American physicians went to Germany in the early 20th century for training because that was the Mecca. That was the best medicine in the entire world. And in 1910, the Flexner Report, which basically remodeled American medicine to bring it up to, up to snuff in terms of its academic uh, credentials, it was modeled on German medicine. And it basically changed the way that American medical schools were run. So how can we explain the transformation of physicians, the best physicians from healers to killers? And keep in mind that German physicians, they were actively designing, administering and carrying out key elements of Nazi racial policy, such as forced sterilization, human experimentation, euthanasia and mass murder. So in this, this uh, diagram over here, um, this is my way of simplifying three streams that led into the German physician collaboration with the Nazis. Number one, it was a unique time in human history. It was the aftermath of World War I. And I will point out that there were certain conditions that existed in Nazi Germany, which led to and facilitated German doctors joining the Nazi party. Number two, at the time, the science, the so-called science of eugenics, which I'll get into, was, was very much accepted by all of the intellectuals in the Western world. And third, there was what was more unique to Germany than any other place was the racial ideology of the superiority of the German race, of the Nordic race. So looking at this in a little more detail, what was that historic background of how German physicians became Nazi murderers? What happened in the aftermath of World War I, as you know, of course, Germany lost the war um, to the Allied powers. And the Allied powers, they imposed the Versailles Treaty on the Germans, which imposed a tremendous financial burden uh, on the German people in order to pay for all of the uh, deaths that, were, that occurred in the West, the money that was expended it was, it was truly an onerous burden on the defeated powers, which by the way, was not, was not repeated at the end of World War II when the allies learned their lesson because of what the Versailles Treaty led to. This led to terrible inflation in Germany where money was worth nothing. It led to severe economic depression. And in times of societal turbulence, people look for extremist solutions and they proliferate. And clearly the Nazis were positing a solution to the misery of the German populace at the end of World War I. German losses during World War I, 1, 1.8 million soldier deaths and 4.2 million wounded. And I might say that the Nazis had a solution to how was it possible that the uh, German army lost in World War I. It was the stab in the back, so-called by the Jews in Germany and the West that Germany was undermined by Jews and this was the false, uh, this was the false um, uh, falsehood that was perpetrated throughout Germany. Racist ideology replaced religious and enlightenment ideals. So you all are familiar of course, with the fact that in the uh, Bible, in Genesis, with the creation of man, it states God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Why do I put this here? Because this really uh, gave birth to the idea in the three of the world's great religions in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that each human being is unique, 
and each human being by being created in the image of God is sacrosanct, that no human life is dispensable. Uh, in 1776, in the wake of the Enlightenment, the Declaration of Independence stated, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Clearly, uh, the issue of slavery at the time uh, was the lie, created the lie to, to this statement. Uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, at that time, that was still uh, an important declaration, even though tragically it excluded a large body of people, uh, a large body of people. Uh, in 1789, the French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity. So these were, these were basic principles of the uniqueness and the sanctity of life based on, cre on religion and based on the enlightenment ideals. Now, the third issue was the idea of racial superiority that was introduced in Europe in the second half of the 19th century. A Frenchman, Arthur de Gobineau, in 1853, he wrote an essay on the inequality of the human races. So we read in the, uh, in the, um, uh, in the Bible, in uh, the Enlightenment, about the equality of every person is, is unique. No, the inequality of the human races was an idea that was injected into Western thought in the 1850s. Then this was followed by the theory of the superiority of the Aryan white master race over the Black and Asian races. Aryans were felt to be superior because they possessed certain biologic traits that set them apart. And mixing of the races was detrimental, so was so-called detrimental to the superior civilization. And the uh, role of Darwin's um, theory of evolution, which led to social Darwinism, was absolutely critical. So, as you know, the theory of uh, evolution propounded by Darwin was that random mutations followed by natural selection in nature would result in the survival of the fittest organisms. Social Darwinism was a daughter of this theory in which people said, if this is the mechanism by which nature uh, chooses the survival of the fittest organisms, shouldn't this apply to human beings as well? And so in the 1870s, a few years after Darwin's book, people began to apply this to individuals in society. The same processes of natural selection that apply to plants and animals apply to humans. And we should not, social Darwinism said, we should not interfere with this natural process. Government should not interfere. And that by interfering and supporting uh, people who are, so, who are uh, medically and, and intellectually disabled, this was contrary to nature. This is unscientific. And this would lead to the proliferation of inferior human beings, social Darwinism. And this then led to the propounding the theory of eugenics by a cousin of Charles Darwin, who basically created the science, the so-called science of eugenics, which said we should improve human populations by controlling breeding to increase the prevalence of desirable mental or physical characteristics. And there were two ways of doing this. There was <clears throat> positive eugenics by which uh, the government would encourage reproduction among people with desirable traits. So intelligent, physically strong men should marry intelligent, physically strong women in order to propagate and improve the human race. Negative eugenics is where the problems really begin and discouraging or preventing reproduction among people with undesirable traits by prohibiting marriage between people who are felt to carry these traits, by forcibly sterilizing them so that they cannot propagate um, uh, genes that were uh, represented physical or mental disabilities, aborting women who might give birth to people in this circumstance and ultimately killing, killing people who have these undesirable traits. Eugenics in the United States, I will, Defer, I will go off from Germany now to the United States and tell you some uncomfortable facts. That eugenics in the US was actually served as a model for Nazi Germany. In 1907, Indiana was the first state to mandate sterilization for certain individuals in state custody, mostly mentally ill and the so called criminally insane. By the late 1920s, 28 states had followed suit. By 1960, 
about 60,000 people had been sterilized in the United States on eugenic grounds, half of these in California. Most of these were people in jail or in psychiatric hospitals. In fact, in the South, in the racist South, there were laws that were created that said that a black man could not marry a black woman or a black woman, a black a white man, because this would pollute the, the, uh, the race. And there were laws that were enacted prohibiting such um, uh, race, interracial marriages. In 1924, the United States Congress enacted an Immigration Act, which severely limited the number of immigrants to the US from Eastern and Southern Europe, Europe East India, Asia, in order to limit the entry of Catholics, Jews, Arabs, and non-white people to, quote, preserve the ideal of American homogeneity. I urge you, by the way, if you're interested in this, this book by Edwin Black, War Against the Weak, is outstanding, is an outstanding book. And so um, after a huge amount of immigration to the United States in the 1880s, 90s, 1910, people began to say, we are, we are basically um, ruining American homogeneity. We don't want these people. They are inferior to us. Um, it may sound certain bells uh, about uh, more current circumstances. But anyway, this act was enacted. Now, Adolf Hitler, who, as you know, was the chancellor, was the head of the Nazi party, he was imprisoned after an abortive attempt, a coup attempt um, uh, in Germany to overthrow the democratic Weimar Republic. And when he was in uh, jail, he wrote a book called Mein Kampf, My Struggle. And in that book, he said, quote, there is today one state in which at least weak beginnings toward a better conception are noticeable. Of course, it is not our model German Republic, he says, but the American Union, in which an effort is made to consult reason at least partially by refusing emigration to certain races from naturalization, it professes in slow beginnings a view which is peculiar to the folkish state concept. Rather turgid kind of uh, uh, a language, but you get the point. America was smart. America was wanted to preserve its uh, white homogeneity and its uh, better gene uh, pool. And so they are refusing immigration to people who would pollute that pure gene pool. And we in Germany, Hitler said, we should learn from the American model. Now, um, eugenics in the United States, this may surprise you. It wasn't considered unethical or racist at the time, but rather it was felt to be supporting cutting edge medical science at top universities. Now look at some of these people who were openly open proponents of eugenics. Presidents Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Margaret Sanger, founder of Planned Parenthood, the Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., philanthropist, the Carnegies, Rockefeller, Kellogg, Lurb, Araman, David Starr Jordan, uh, Jordan, first president of Stanford University, Charles Eliot, president of Harvard, Alexander Graham Bell, Nobel laureate Alexis Carell. This is the cream of the intelligentsia of America, and these people were four square behind eugenics. This was the science of the future. This was the way to improve, to improve the human race. These people weren't necessarily racist, but they clearly felt that the principles of having people who lacked any kind of disabilities, these are the people that we should favor, we should encourage their marriage and so forth and discourage uh, uh, people who had uh, what they felt to be genetically transferred undesirable traits from having children. So we come to the story now of Carrie Buck. She is the person on the left, the younger woman, and her mother, Emma Buck. Emma Buck was a, a woman in uh, Virginia who had three children, possibly by three different men. She was unmarried, and her, uh, all of these children were given up to foster care. Emma, uh, Carrie, was the youngest of the three, and she was given to a foster family. And while in the foster family, uh, Carrie became pregnant and uh, she delivered a child. And it was felt that um, uh, Emma was, uh, was intellectually disabled, uh, as they called it then, uh, feeble-minded, that Carrie was feeble-minded and her daughter was sure to be feeble-minded. And so the state of Virginia felt that it was appropriate to enact a law uh, to forcibly sterilize Carrie Buck 
and you will, and so this, um, uh, and by the way, the reason that Carrie Buck became pregnant is because she was raped by the nephew of the foster parents who had her in their care. So um, this was a test case. Uh, Virginia promulgated the law of forcible sterilization. And uh, there were lawyers that were appointed to carry Buck because the people in Virginia wanted this to go up to the Supreme Court to see whether or not it would be legal and not contrary to the US Constitution to enact such laws. And in fact, um, <clears throat> The US Supreme Court majority opinion eight to one in 1927 in the case of Buck v. Bell. Um, and the US Supreme Court stated by a huge majority, a Virginia law permitting forced sterilization of the so-called unfit, it was constitutional. And Holmes in his, uh, in his verdict said, quote, we have seen more than once that the public welfare may call upon the best citizens for their lives. By that he means when the uh, government um, uh, drafts young men uh, to fight a war. It would be strange, he said, if it could not call upon those who already sap the strength of the state for these lesser sacrifices in order to prevent our being swamped with incompetence. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. The principle that sustains compulsory vaccination, rings a bell, is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. So the rationale behind this was clear. Um, and you'll see that this was exactly the same rationale that was used by the Germans, but they took it much farther than we did in the United States. In the United States, it stopped at forced sterilization. <coughs> Excuse me. In Germany, it led to not only forced sterilization, but it led to euthanasia, murder of these people. The aftermath of Buck B. Buck B. Bell. So she was sterilized five months after the decision. Her sister required an appendectomy. And during that, she was sterilized, was not told that she was sterilized until decades later. And she wondered why it was that she couldn't have children. <clears throat> Over two dozen states enacted similar laws after Buck v. Bell doubling the American sterilizations. Virginia sterilization law inspired Nazis to pass the 1933 law for protection against genetically defective offspring. And this ultimately led to 400,000 forced sterilizations in Germany. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the German social Darwinists developed a, uh, an ideology uh, called racial hygiene. And in 1895, Alfred Plötz coined the term racial hygiene and he founded the German Society of Racial Hygiene in 1904. <clears throat> German social Darwinists were, they were fearful about the de degeneration of the race because medical care for the weak had begun to destroy the natural struggle for survival. Poor and misfits of the world were beginning to multiply faster than the talented and fit. <clears throat> and they advocated that we should support only those poor who are past childbearing age, age, but for those who are during child caring age, we should not care for them because they may propagate um, the inferior people, the weak people, and traditional medical care helps the individual, but it endangers the race. <clears throat> and so eugenics in Germany before World War I those who supported eugenics, they were both from the liberal and conservative ends of the political and academic spectrum. After World War I and the defeat of Germany, the right-wing activists influenced the movement <clears throat> and stressed negative eugenics. And this ideology was incorporated into the Nazi medical world. In the 1920s, German eugenics was seen not only necessary to improve the race of the whole world, the human race, but to purify and improve the Nordic German race. And so national socialism or Nazism was viewed 
as the political expression of biologic knowledge. I want you to keep that in mind because you will see that the Nazis during their reign of Germany between 1933 and 1945, <coughs> they stressed that their politics was based on science, on biologic knowledge. It was not strictly a political ideology, but it was based on, on science. Now, on January 30th, Hitler was appointed chancellor of Germany and remained in power until the defeat of Germany in 45. From the start, the Nazi regime tasked German racial hygienists with providing the bi biologic foundation for the Nazi racial state. And Nazi racial policies based on the pseudoscience of eugenics carried out egregiously unethical acts of negative eugenic principles, forced sterilization leading to euthanasia of people who are felt to be genetically defective. And so the Nuremberg laws were propagated in 1935. These were considered public health measures actually to cleanse the German population from unwanted elements. And the law for the protection of German blood and German honor, it forbade marriages and sexual relations between non-Jews and Jews. <clears throat> Later, it was extended to all non-Aryans to prevent racial pollution. Jews were considered to be a mongrel race, a combination of, quote, the Negro and the Oriental. They also passed the law for the protection of the genetic health of the German people. So this required all couples, the Germans, uh, Germans as well as Jews, to submit to medical examinations before marriage to see if racial damage might result from the marriage. It forbade marriages between individuals suffering from venereal disease, feeble-mindedness, epilepsy, or any other genetic infirmity. And people with these conditions could marry, but only after they were sterilized. Now, this is a German propaganda poster, and the Germans, the Nazis were expert propagandists. And so you, this uh, uh, appeared in one of the uh, Nazi publications. It shows in the upper left-hand corner, Adolf Hitler standing with a, probably a caricature of a Jewish doctor. And you see a jumble of humanity over here that the German doctor wants to protect. But Hitler, with his forceful arm, crushes the people, and he molds from them the ideal German Nordic Aryan man. And notice that the Jewish doctor is no longer in the picture. So sterilization under the Nazis. The law for the prevention of genetically diseased offspring was passed in July 33 to improve the race. They set up genetic health courts all throughout Germany. And these courts consisted of two doctors and one lawyer, and they decided whether a person was going to be ster sterilized with or without their consent. The eugenic indications that required sterilization were feeble-mindedness, schizophrenia, manic depressive, genetic epilepsy, Huntington's chorea, genetic blindness, deafness, severe alcoholism. These were all felt to be genetically transmitted. And so to improve the racial stock of the Germans, these people were not permitted to have children. And for if you were a physician and you diagnosed any of these ailments in your patient, you had to refer your patient to the genetic health courts, whether you, want, whether you felt a, a, a pro or con in terms of, of a sterilization. People who refused to be sterilized were usually sent to concentration camps. And how were they sterilized? Men with vasectomies, women tubal ligation. As you know, at that time, it was a much bigger operation than it is today. And the Germans felt that that was very slow and inefficient. So they tried injecting carbon dioxide into the fallopian tubes of women to see if that would cause scarring and create sterility. They also tried to rad irradiate the people because operations for tubal ligation were too time consuming, consuming and resource intensive. 400,000 Germans were sterilized. And then when World War II broke out in September, 1939, they said enough of sterilization. Now we have to kill these people. It's much more efficient and it will clearly carry out the goals that we wish. Interestingly, after World War II, there was a Nuremberg doctor's trial and they were one of the crimes that they were not accused of was forced sterilization. Why? Because similar laws were passed in the United States and other European nations. How could you, how can you put them on the dock and prosecute them for something that was legal in Western countries? <clears throat> and as you can see, there were many other countries that had sterilization laws, US, Switzerland, et cetera, many countries in Europe. 
Sweden alone sterilized 62,000 people, almost all women between 34 and 74. But as I said, when World War I or II broke out, the Germans felt that euthanasia was the way to go. And euthanasia, which, mean, which they interpret as an easy or gentle death or mercy killing. So there was, there was basis for this. It did, didn't just pop up as an idea in September 1939. There was, there was ground for this. Adolf Just in 1895 wrote the right to death, that there should be control over the death of an individual and must ultimately belong to the social organism, namely the state, to preserve the health of the Volk. The state already possesses that right, he said, in war, where thousands of healthy people are sacrificed for the good of the state. You remember Oliver Wendell Holmes, he alluded to that in his, in his decision. So ultimately, this was a bioethical argument. The state must be allowed to kill in order to keep the social organism alive and healthy. And this is an outstanding book. Robert Lifton, The Nazi Doctors, is uh, really a classic, going into the mentality of the Nazi doctors who were murderers. <clears throat> a very important book was published in 1920 by two distinguished German professors. One was a jurist, the other was a psychiatrist, and it was the permission to destroy life, unworthy of life. Leben zum Werten Leben was the term. What was an unworthy life? People with incurable illnesses, mentally ill, feeble-minded, deformed children. And this therefore medicalized the entire concept. The therapeutic goal was a healing treatment and both the patient would be released from their burden and suffering and it will also release the country from the burden of supporting these people. Frederick Nietzsche, the famed uh, uh, philosopher in Germany, he was very clear. The sick person is a parasite of society. So you see that there were roots that led to the euthanasia program in 1940 and 1939 in Germany, it did not just arrive out of, out, of, uh, uh, out of air, there were roots to this. And unfortunately, there were actually euthanasia advocates elsewhere, even though it was not practiced elsewhere. I told you before, Alexis, Alexis Carroll, who won the um, Nobel Prize in 1935, he invented the iron lung, which was a device that saved the lives of many children uh, and adults who had polio and their respiratory muscles were paralyzed and he kept them alive in these, in these inventions. And he wrote <coughs> in his book, <coughs> Man the Unknown, that the criminal and the insane should be humanely and economically disposed of in small euthanasia institutions supplied with proper gases. This was 1935, this was, this was years before Auschwitz. And here you have a Nobel Prize winner whose invention saved countless lives advocating euthanasia <coughs> of <coughs> individuals, um, uh, even suggesting the means of doing it with proper gases. Surprisingly, in 1937, a Gallup poll in the United States showed 45% of Americans who favored euthanasia for defective infants. And in 1942, <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Dr. Foster Kennedy, who was professor of neurology at Cornell, argued in the official journal of the American Psychiatric Association, he argued for the killing of retarded children ages five and older, quote, hopeless ones who should never have been born, nature's mistakes. Now, so you see that there were these ideas from intellectuals outside of Germany, but it was only in Germany <coughs> that it was in fact implemented. <coughs> the euthanasia program was uh, lasted from October 39, one month after the beginning of the war until August 1941. Dr. Leo Alexander, who was one of the American witnesses at the Nuremberg Medical Trial wrote, the beginnings at first were merely a subtle shift in emphasis in the basic attitudes of physicians. It started with the acceptance there is such a thing as life not worthy to be lived. Gradually, the sphere of those to be included in this category was enlarged. So <coughs> it started <coughs> with the physically and the mentally disabled in Germany, and then it led to Jews, to the Roman people, to homosexuals, to, to Polish prisoners of war, et cetera, et cetera. The Nazi euthanasia program of Germans was strictly secret. The German people were not told that their 
children and adults were being killed. It was never authorized officially by German law. There was only a Hitler decree. It began with killing deformed and mentally retarded children. And it was administered by the Committee for the Scientific Treatment. And I put that in italics. Again, everything the Nazis done was based on science. <clears throat> the Committee for the Scientific Treatment of Severe Genetically Determined Illnesses. <clears throat> a midwife who delivered a child that appeared to have a physical disability and doctors delivering these babies, they had to register the child with local health authorities the same way as with the uh, uh, sterilization program. So child euthanasia was where it began. Children were selected. That's the term they use. It was comparable to Darwin's natural selection, science, were sent to one of 28 institutions, mostly hospitals, that were equipped with killing facilities. Parents were told their children were being sent for improved treatment. And how did they kill the children? They injected them with morphine, they overdosed them with barbiturates, they gassed them with cyanide or carbon monoxide. And occasionally children were simply starved so that their deaths could be disguised as due to illness. They died naturally, <clears throat> usually of pneumonia when they were so debilitated by being starved. The parents of these children who were killed, they were sent a standardized letter that the child had died suddenly and unexpectedly of made up a diagnosis, brain edema, appendicitis, pneumonia, or other fabricated illnesses. And because the German doctors felt there would be an epidemic if they buried these people, the body had to be cremated immediately. And so they returned the ashes to the parents. Who knows if the parents actually got the ashes of their particular child. <clears throat> the euthanasia program then extended to adults. It was called T4 because it was the address of the building in Berlin where this was administered from. And so there were questionnaires that were given to doctors and midwives and uh, the group that decided on whether a person would live or die consisted of two pediatricians and one psychiatrist. If the, there was one sheet of paper where they looked at the clinical data, sort of check boxes that were put in by the physician. If you were slated to die, there was a plus sign in the box at the bottom of the sheet and those spared were a, a not minus sign. And the decisions of life and death were based solely on questionnaires. The patients were never even examined by the committee of three. And this is a, <clears throat> a, a photograph of an actual one of these uh, documents. You can see in the lower left-hand corner in the black box, there's a plus and the individual that this referred to was slated for death. Not too many questions asked, as you can see on this one page. <clears throat> so the first, uh, and how was adult euthanasia going to be carried out? In January, 1940, the first large scale test of adult euthanasia of German patients in Brandenburg, a psychiatric hospital. It was the first use of a shower facility into which patients were led naked and gassed with carbon monoxide from a pipe with small holes. This was called they were told they were going to be disinfected. <clears throat> the bodies were then cremated and the, this was done in the hospitals in Germany. The bodies were cremated after the gold fillings were removed. This was all a prelude to Auschwitz. The gassing was administered by a physician. This was all a medical procedure. This was all medical. And so the doctors were in charge of putting the carbon monoxide in, leading the patients in the doctors wore white coats. This inspired trust. These people were led into these uh, showers. Who's leading me in? A doctor wearing a white coat. How could I go wrong? I trust this man. And Brandenburg served as the model for disinfections elsewhere. Uh, over time, though, German relatives of victims, they became suspicious over the manner of death of their loved ones. And people who lived in the vicinity of the hospitals, these were all hospitals in the middle of large cities, they noted buses of people arriving at the hospital. And this was followed by hours of smoke from chimneys that were the crematoria. And there was minimal, but some resistance on the part of psychiatrists. This is a, uh, and the Germans of course were excellent at documenting everything. So this was a picture of one of the women who presumably had some psychiatric illness uh, who was slated for death. The T4 euthanasia program ended up killing about 70,000 patients. It went from October 39, one month after the outbreak of the war until Hitler ordered it stopped after 19 months, and you'll see why. There were gas chambers in six centers. These were the cities 
where the hospitals were located. I actually visited the Berenberg um, Hospital, and you'll see a picture soon of what the shower looked like. What happened after August 1941, euthanasia did not stop. It just wasn't official. They didn't gas people. They simply starved them. Uh, they withheld basic treatment of illnesses and so forth. And the estimate is that about over 400,000 German so-called useless eaters were directly or indirectly killed by the end of the war in 1945. So why did they stop in, uh, in 1940? So what eventually persuaded the Nazis to stop the euthanasia was not resistance by doctors, but it was rather a general resistance among the German people. Word got out, they could not keep it a secret anymore. And it was actually articulated by a few courageous Protestant and Catholic religious leaders. Interestingly, these same religious leaders virtually did not raise their voice at all when, it, when the uh, Jews were murdered in mass numbers in the same sorts of uh, disinfection programs. And this is what the lovely shower looked like. You can see the shower heads on the top, nice and clean. This is in the hospital itself. And the uh, adults were led naked into this. The door was closed. And here you have a picture actually of one of the nurses at that time looking through the peephole to see when everybody was dead so that the door, so that they could begin to remove the carbon monoxide through pipes and they can open up the door, remove the bodies and then put them in the crematorium. And these are some individuals who were with me on the trip. The woman with the blue skirt on the left was our guide. The woman to her left was the interpreter. And the gentleman there is one of the bioethics people who accompanied us on the trip. And this is a picture of one of the crematoria that were in the hospital. And this is a picture from that time. You notice that huge chimney. That is a chimney on part of the hospital uh, in one of the crematorium of one of the hospitals that, uh, uh, that incinerated the bodies of the German citizens who were euthanized. Now, what was the justification for euthanasia? There were lots of justification. Number one, the Nazis said there was a biologic need. We had to preserve the health and the purity of the Volk and these people were, were, were making the Volk impure. Number two, there were big economic reasons, especially during the war. Caring for mentally and physically ill people was expensive and it was a drain on the economy, especially during time of war. And the resources that were allocated for these people, uh, if by killing them, you would free up the doctors, hospital beds, and the food that was needed for the war effort. Patriotism, again, coming back to this notion, the best German youth were dying in, in the battle of World War II for the good of the state. So if it was their duty to even put their lives on the line, how much more so was it the duty of the infirm to die for the good of the state as well? Something alluded to, by the way, uh, by um, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, he was not talking about euthanasia, he was talking about sterilization, but it was a similar type of logic. And finally, there was the so-called humanitarian reason. Let's relieve the physical and mentally ill of their suffering and relieve their parents of the burden of their care. So here you have five reasons that the Nazis put forward as justifying killing people with mental and physical disabilities. And as I said before, there was a tremendous amount of propaganda. <clears throat> this was one of the sheets that showed a German who is bearing the, the burden of these grotesquely caricatured people with mental and physical disabilities. You are sharing a load of genetically ill individual costs, 50,000 Reichsmarks by the age of 60. Now, just so you know that the Nazis, actually the Nazi doctors had a lot of good things as well. And I put this to you to show you that they were not just monsters. Well, they were in the sense of murderers, but they actually, they actually uh, uh, had a lot of good uh, ideas in, in Nazi medicine, marital counseling, obligatory reporting of venereal disease, discouraging smoking and alcohol use long before the uh, 1964 Surgeon General report in the United States, preventive medicine encouraged healthy living habits, mass x-ray screening for cancer and TB, screening for occupationally related diseases and encouraging organic uh, foods. Um, Robert Proctor's book, The Nazi War on Cancer, he got a lot of pushback actually. People said, how could you write a book showing that the Nazi doctors actually stood for some good things? And he was simply as a historian reporting the facts. Um, believe it or not, medical ethics were taught to medical students under the Nazis. 
All the medical students, in fact, were given classes. They had to take courses in medical ethics. And the textbook was written by the Nazi doctor, Rudolf Rahm. And it stated only Aryan doctors are good doctors. The priority of the good of the Volk over that of the individual. Hereditary illnesses were a burden for the Volk. And euthanasia of disabled, mentally ill, retarded, ethically was justified. So when you have a prestigious uh, professor standing up there and giving you all of these reasons why euthanasia is appropriate and ethically right, and that's mic intertwined with all of these otherwise good medical um, uh, ideas, you as a student, it's, it's easy to see how you would say, well, this professor, they know their stuff. I'm, we're going to go along with that. They obviously are, they, they are speaking ethical things. And this is a copy actually of the book by Rudolf Rahm, and it says medical rights and ethics, um, medical rights and ethics by Rudolf Rahm. So that was medical ethics under the Nazis. Now, I love this quote. This is really an amazing quote. Dr. Sherwin Newland, who passed away, he was a surgeon at Yale and he's written a number of excellent books. He actually reviewed, went on uh, the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, had an exhibit called Deadly Medicine. And it went through all of the things that I'm telling you about. And he said, after going through this, uh, he wrote an article in the New Republic, to my startled dismay, startled dismay, I found myself understanding why so much of the German medical establishment acted as it did. I realized that given the circumstances, I might have done the same. That's, that's incredible, you say, right? And yet this is a man who is honestly telling you this, who devotes his life to the healing profession, who is a who is obviously an outstanding ethical person saying I could have gotten sucked in also if I had been a young medical student in Nazi Germany at that time. And now we morph from the murder of the German uh, people who were uh, physically and medically disabled to the uh, desire to exterminate all Jews in the world. <clears throat> the so-called Jewish problem it was viewed as a medical problem, one that required a medical solution. By the way, the 80th anniversary of the Wannsee Conference that was held in, a, in Wannsee, Germany, a suburb of Berlin, the 80th anniversary was January 20th, a few days ago. And 15 uh, German uh, uh, members of the army, the SS, the government bureaucracy, it was at that point that the uh, J Jewish problem uh, was addressed. And they said, our goal is to murder 11 million Jews in uh, all of Europe. Uh, the German medical and political elite, they said the reason for doing this, they medicalized various forms of social, sexual, political, or racial deviance. Jews, gay persons, Romani, Marxists, and other groups, they were typecast as health hazards to the German population. I keep coming back to this to show you how, they, how the Nazis really played on this thing, that they were doing the right thing, hygiene, medicine, science, natural selection. This wasn't a crime, this was, they were acting appropriately. The extermination of these groups was viewed as a legitimate public health measure, similar to the eradication of disease spreading bacteria, rodents, or insects. And so here is a propaganda picture of Adolf Hitler, doctor of the German people, Aus der Deutschen Volk. He was the doctor of the German people. In 1929, Hitler spoke to a Nazi physician league you, the nationalist socialist doctors, I cannot do without you for a single day, not a single hour. If not for you, if you fail me, all is lost. What good are our struggles if the health of our people is in danger? And Werner uh, uh, Jochmann, he quoted Adolf Hitler saying, countless Ill illnesses are caused by one bacillus, the Jews. We will become healthy when we eliminate the Jews. And this quote from Dr. Fritz Klein, when asked how he reconciled his action in the concentration camps, murdering Jews with his ethical obligation, he said it stated simply, out of respect for human life, I would remove a purulent appendix from a diseased body. The Jews are the purulent appendix of the body of Europe. And here is another uh, poster of the Nazis. And look how clever this is. It shows a microscope. And under the microscope, you see in the round circle, you see the Jewish star, you see the hammer and sickle, you see the uh, English pound. So these people were reduced to microbes in a very literal sense with, uh, as infectious germs. And also you see the Nazi um, uh, man over here who is basically uh, decontaminating the strong German oak tree and killing the rodents that are represented, representative of Jews. 
practice makes perfect. The experience gained from the uh, T4 euthanasia program killing Germans was invaluable in perfecting techniques for mass murder. Many of the same doctors and nurses who were decommissioned from their duties in the T4 program when it was stopped, they were now experts and they were sent east to Poland to the newly constructed death camps in Poland of which Auschwitz was the largest. There were about six of these uh, Treblinka, uh, Buchenwald and so forth. Knowledge derived from the T4 campaign was used in carrying out the ultimate program of racial hygiene by murdering millions of innocent human beings, mostly Jews, but also Poles, homosexuals, and Romanian gas chambers. Medical experiments were carried out on a massive scale. They were carried out by prestigious doctors associated with the cream of the German medical institutions. Many of these people were commissioned by the army to find treatments for illnesses and trauma of German troops. So they experimented on Jews and they purposely infected them with typhus, malaria, typhoid fever, infected limbs with bacteria to test antibiotics. And the ethical justification was simple. These prisoners are gonna be killed anyway. Let's not use, why not use them for information that could save thousands of lives? And so you see the slippery slope as it occurred in Germany, starting with eugenics, sterilization law, the Nuremberg laws, child euthanasia, adult euthanasia, medical experiments, and the final solution of gassing of millions of people. And some of these lessons from the Nazi medicine experience, the ease with which the highest medical ideals can be violated, this did not occur 500 years ago. This occurred in my lifetime when I was a baby, but it occurred in, in our time. Physicians are not immune to barbaric societal ideologies that may lead them to the worst perversion of medical ethics involving murder and forced experimentation. Intelligence and professional achievement are unrelated to moral behavior. There's no correlation. Just because you're a brilliant scientist or physician does not mean that you will act morally. And finishing up with some, here's the more controversial aspect. Can we learn lessons from these to apply to today? Can anything be learned from this history that's relevant to today's debates about assisted suicide and euthanasia. And here's the key question. Does the voluntary consent of the patient where assisted suicide or medical aid in dying, which is now legal in 10 states, and euthanasia, which is legal in Canada, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Colombia, Switzerland, does the voluntary consent of the patient make such a profound difference so that any attempt at comparison is offensive. Should I not even be raising this? Well, one can make a point and say, once the threshold is crossed of accepting legally and ethically the intentional taking of life, even requested by the patient or aided uh, and aided or carried out by the physician, the likelihood of a slippery slope is present. The more the intentional taking of life becomes acceptable, the easier it will be to extend the criteria for physician assisted, um, a physician um, uh, euthanasia and um, uh, aid in dying. The slippery slope, euthanasia in countries in Europe today. Voluntary adult euthanasia led to involuntary. By involuntary, I mean that if a person has a living will that says, if I ever become demented, um, I want to be um, a severely demented, I want to be euthanized. And at that point, the person cannot give their voluntary consent, but on the basis of a written document before the patient is taken and perhaps even not against their wishes, but they're euthanized, that's happening. Voluntary child euthanasia to involuntary child euthanasia. Euthanasia for severe physical suffering and today euthanasia is also carried out in Europe for severe mental suffering as well. This notion of Lebens und Werkens Leben, life unworthy of life. So the rise of an absolutist view of patient autonomy in many medical and philosophical circles of some European countries, Canada, and 10 US states, it has reintroduced the notion of life unworthy of life as determined by patients and not the state. Does that make all the difference is my question. Once assisted suicide and its likely offspring, euthanasia, become increasingly accepted in the US, how might the cost of caring for a tidal wave of aging baby boomers interact with an increasingly stressed healthcare budget to broaden the scope of physician-assisted suicide and make it not only acceptable, but desirable? Might voluntary consent 
be influenced by fiscal realities? Might the right to assisted suicide become an obligation? The more it gets accepted by a, by a, uh, by a country, by a state, might people then feel that they are being selfish when they have a terminal illness, using up the resources of their family rather than agreeing to assisted suicide or euthanasia? And um, so why should an increase in physician assisted suicide and euthanasia matter as long as it's involuntary? Will this affect the moral fabric of our society? Is the notion of the sanctity of life merely an outdated religious value? Will the increasing secularization of Western society have implications for what is considered ethical medical practice? Famous quotation from Fyodor Dostoevsky, if there is no God, then all is permitted. Once the intentional taking of life by physicians is accepted, will there be unanticipated consequences? Will it weaken medicine's commitment to patients in situations of societal stress? And uh, this is a bibliography from some outstanding books um, that I would recommend for those of you who are uh, interested in pursuing this further. And I just finished, I love this painting by Louis Luke Files of the doctor. It is an English painter at the end of the 1800s uh, of a physician who is agonizing over a child who is critically ill while the parents in the background, the mother is crying and the father tries to comfort her. I think it encompasses everything that we know and hope for in, in the humanism of the medical profession, something we hope will never be lost. And I think that this shows it in a very beautiful way. So I thank you all for your attention. And in the remaining time, I'm more than happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Prager. That was a fantastic talk. I've heard it before, and it um, it is always excellent, and there's always something else to hear. Um, a reminder, we have the chat box at the bottom and the Q&A box. We have just about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, there is There are some comments in the chat, and there's a question in the Q&A box. Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to read the question from the Q and A box, and then we can get to the chat box. Dr. Prager, somebody is asking: Aren't medical doctors still using the discoveries from the Nazi regime physicians, who also experimented on Jewish people? How is society contending with that, funding further research, or advocating for the curing the illnesses discovered during World War II? Oh, I, so the question is whether we would use the information that was gained from the experiments. That's right. And, and, and given that we are using information gained, how do we reconcile? You know, that is a very difficult ethical conundrum. So on the one hand, there is no question but that the information gained was gained horribly, unethically. And on the other hand, there are certain instances where uh, the information might actually be... be um, helpful and save lives and improve and, and, and improve the medical profession. So, you know, depending on how one feels about that, um, I suppose that one way of negotiating uh, that conundrum would be to say, we can use the information as long as we make known the circumstances under which this information was obtained, not just anonymize it that, oh, we have this particular treatment or whatever procedure. It, 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 it is incumbent upon the medical profession in those circumstances where such information may be of significant use today to make known to society how that information was obtained and thereby give a certain amount of, of um, of uh, acknowledgement of the suffering of the innocent people that gave their lives so that others may live or benefit, obviously without their consent. But I, I think that that's one way of approaching it. One could obviously take an absolutist stand and say, no, these are contaminated information, we should never use it. But, um, you know, uh, I, I, suspect that, um, I suspect that the approach that I've, that I've suggested is, is, is an ethically acceptable one in a, in a very, very difficult kind of conundrum, yeah. Yeah, and it is hard to unknow something once you know it. Yes, yes, yeah. uh, absolutely. And especially, you know, it's striking when you show the list of people who, who believed, at least on the United States end of, in eugenics, it is, it is, you know, we benefit so much from the contributions of Roosevelt and, and, and yeah. others on that list. Alexis Carell and so forth, right, yeah. 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 Um, 
there is some comments in the chat that we should talk about. Um, I'll read them also to you. There are states in the South that legalize sterilization of the poor uh, and uh, poor women. To this day, these laws have not changed in the United States. Actually, the, Med the Center for Medical Ethics gave a talk that I moderated uh, about a year or two ago of um, the continued sterilization of prisoners in California that was not outlawed on paper until 1979 and continued in practice until the 2000s. Uh, and now there uh, was recently a bill passed in California to provide reparations for those women who were sterilized, some against, well, all against their will and some against their knowledge as well. Um, another panel um, um, attendee wrote, let's not forget that between 1930s and 1970s, approximately one third of Puerto Rican female population of childbearing age were sterilized, the highest rate in the world. Most of them did not know that the procedure known as la operacion was irreversible. Mm -hmm. You know, Thank these you are these are contemporary ongoing examples. Mm -hmm. uh, I But in terms of the what the individual said before about poor people in the South, is the implication that these people are being sterilized against their wishes today? I is that is that what that person was saying in the chat? Well, I'm wondering if this is in reference to the comment that I made. If some um, that came from Nadir, if you want to um, if you want to clarify Dr. Prager's question, um, I, you know there are as I mentioned, for example, in California, up until very recently, legal. Oh, here, let's see, sterilization was legal. Yeah, oh, um, sterilization was legal in California. Um, and Nadir is answering yes, because of their poverty and they would be on welfare. So this, you know, this feels like, um, as we said, an ongoing uh, willingness. Well, I can tell you that as a result of the eugenics and the forced sterilization, I, I, I am not an expert on the policies throughout the United States, but I know that here in New York and in other states, it's virtually impossible to sterilize a woman who has intellectual disability. I mean, um, uh, it, it, it can't be carried out. I think birth control is something that may be used, uh, especially if there's a parent that, that's involved, but sterilization I think is just off the charts. I, I, I don't think that that's, um, that that's allowed at all, at least in most of the states. And I think that it's obviously a a heritage of, of the eugenics policies that we talked about. Yeah. Let me ask you, while we're waiting for others to put questions in, you had uh, mentioned early in the talk about the eugenics movement in the United States, and it's frightening. Uh, you had also made a comment about how the United States stopped, drew the line, if such a thing can be said, about uh, at, at sterilizing women, um, whereas Germany continued on um, and well, continued to make the next steps. Well, we, we drew the line at euthanizing. We did not draw the line at sterilizing women. Women were, were definitely among those sterilized, no question. No, I may have, uh, if I said- No, 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 I was commenting that, that we allowed sterilization, but we didn't go further. And so I wonder what about the United States made us pause and not take the next step? You mean why we didn't go to euthanasia? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, obviously there's a dramatic difference between sterilization and murder. Um, I should say, by the way, I didn't mention it. The one organized group that was totally against uh, forced sterilization and eugenics was the Catholic Church. As, as we know, the Catholic Church is very pro, pro children and having children, etc. But they were the most uh, strong uh, voice uh, against that. No, I think I think there's a huge difference between um, between sterilizing somebody and, and, and euthanizing somebody and the United States, and not only the United States, I know of no other uh, Western country where euthanasia was carried out legally. Germany just you know, took it to the nth degree based on their interpretation of the science and of the exigencies of World War II. But I know of no other country where um, uh, human beings were, were euthanized against their, their will. In, 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 for the purposes of promoting the principles of eugenics. Yeah. There's another question in the chat. What about parents who are caring for their disabled children? Have there been noted cases where the adult or child with disabilities goes against their parents' wishes? Uh, where the child goes against the, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Can you well, say that again? I wonder, so the question is regarding uh, patients with a disability. 
Yeah. Uh, and I suppose that the potential for differences of, you know, different opinions or wishes between the, the adult caregiver and the patient with disability. Well, I think, you know, it, it may come down to a legal issue. I mean, obviously, people with disabilities and children with disabilities have rights and the parents, uh, you know, parents cannot ride roughshod uh, and uh, over their of their children's uh, wishes. I, I think I would need to know a specific, you know, instance or question, um, uh, you know, in order to be able to answer that uh, better. Um, clearly, look, you know, on, on the issue of on the issue of um, sterilization, I can tell you, uh, my wife actually, um, when I was in medical school, she uh, worked in a school with, uh, which was uh, dedicated to, to treating um, uh, children, adolescent children with uh, various types of intellectual disability, a lot of children with Down syndrome. And many of the parents wanted their children sterilized. They were terrified that their children would be abused sexually and their children having no knowledge of what was involved in sex and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's not, this is a very delicate kind of an issue. I think the issue of, of contraception has uh, obviated the need for sterilization, if, if, uh, especially with long-acting contraceptives. But, but the notion, um, because of the, the reason for, they wanted them sterilized was not for eugenic reasons. They did not want their children to be impregnated and to have to get pregnant uh, you know, when they had no understanding of what was happening to their body, et cetera, et cetera. So these were well-intentioned parents who were terrified of the potential for sexual abuse of their children. So that's a very delicate kind of an issue. Another question in the chat, uh, did the Catholic Church in Germany protest the euthanasia program? Um, that is a, uh, once, once it was found out, uh, there were a few church members who spoke out um, publicly uh, against uh, euthanasia and uh, against euthanasia. And it was largely the church that uh, spoke out the most. As I mentioned, it wasn't the medical profession. It wasn't the psychiatrist. It was the church. And the church was reflective of the knowledge of a significant number of people. And the Nazis were very afraid that they would lose the confidence and support of the German people at a very delicate time during the beginning of the war. And so that's when they put a stop to the official policy of, of euthanasia. So the church definitely did play a significant role. But as I also pointed out, the church was virtually mum when it came to uh, the gassing of millions of people in the concentration camps. And uh, of course, people have said, well, they didn't know and so on and so forth. That's, that's a whole different uh, kind of a discussion. But, but tragically, the church did not come out. And the truth is to have come out, it might have endangered the person's life. The Nazis would have, uh, you know, there were a, a handful of people who, who came out against that. These people were, were uh, executed. So this was a life-threatening kind of a stance that one would take. Um, we unfortunately have to wrap up at 744. We have one minute left. Thank you, Dr. Prager, for, a, 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 you know, these, it is hard to have a robust discussion on Zoom, but I, we always manage it with you. So thank you for that. And thank you to the audience for your questions. Thank you for joining us this evening. If you'd like to receive a recording of the lecture or you want to jo join the LIFSER for the um, Center for Medical Ethics, you can email ethics at cumc.columbia.edu. And we hope that you will be able to join us for our next event on February 23rd, discussing the ethical challenges in the care of critically ill newborn. Dr. Mercurio from Yale University will be joining us. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a good evening. Hi, thank you.